Okay, welcome everyone to the 69th meeting of the American Society of Human Genetics. I am your 2019 president, Les Biesecker, and I officially welcome you to the opening of our annual meeting. I do want to take just one quick second to brag about our success already. Our current registration is north of 8,100 individuals, so congratulations to ASHG. And I look forward to a fantastic meeting from this moment to the very end on Saturday, and I look forward to participating in it with every one of you. So, the title of this talk. I want to uh, use this talk to get across a couple ideas to you and a couple of things that we are trying to do as a society on your behalf. And like many presidential speakers, I think it's important to start with a little bit of a background or definition about what this thing is that I'm talking about. So exceptionalism. It has a couple of different definitions, the first of which is being special, exceptional, or unique. That is straightforward, and that is mostly what we're going to talk about today. The second one is a different one that has uh, a little more of a, shall we say, political context, which I am most definitely not going to speak about today. That is a belief that a particular nation does not conform to an established norm. We're not going there today. All right, so what is exceptionalism? So exceptional or exceptionalism itself is forming an exception of something that is not ordinary, is not common or is rare, or something that is better than average, superior due to exception or rarity. And I have to tell you, with absolutely no tinge of false modesty, I bristled at this because I want to very much not be an exceptional president, and I want to tell you why I feel that way, why I think that way, and what that means for us as a society. So, how I think about this is that it is not, in fact, an honorary appointment to be asked to be the president of this society. It is, in fact, a really important job. That job is to do work on your behalf for our field in order to make you more successful, and that does not require an exceptional geneticist. We have an enormous history uh, through the entire years, 69 years of existence of our society, of people who have done this work on your behalf to make this society a powerful and positive influence on genetics science and society as a whole. Many of these people have done outstanding work in this regard, and it is different from being an outstanding geneticist per se. I want to distinguish this because we have a session following this address that addresses exactly that, which is honoring our exceptional geneticists. Here they are. These are people who have done amazing things for our field and for our society scientifically that we applaud, encourage, and endorse in every way we can. And we, those are honors. Those are people who are exceptional. Those are people who we want to reward for their amazing accomplishments. But I am an unexceptional president. I'm here to do work for you, and the most important thing I want to do is to make our science, our clinical care, our society as widely accepted and positively viewed as I possibly can do. I think we have a barrier to that. The barrier is this notion of exceptionalism, and to that end, I'm going to introduce the topic here today briefly and encourage all of you to attend the symposium on Thursday evening, which features three remarkable speakers, Robert Resta, Teresa Marteau, and Kyle Brothers, who are gonna talk about the history of exceptionalism, where this idea came from, 
what is the behavioral science behind some of these notions of exceptionalism? And then the everyday reality of how exceptionalism plays out in its most extreme example in the clinic. And I want to have robust debate on that. I'm clearly providing a point of view here. Our moderator, my good friend and colleague, Katrina Goddard, is going to moderate your questions. And I want us to have a robust debate about what this is and what this is not, because I think it is essential to the success of our society and every one of you. Here are some things that I hope will be addressed in that session, and I hope that you will think about and engage with, with our speakers and going forward in our field. There are notions out there that genetic science and the practice of genetic medicine are distinct from all other realms of science and clinical care. There is an idea out there that genetic risk perception is uniquely or exceptionally imprecise in the context of all other kinds of risk prediction that are used every day in science and in healthcare. There is an idea out there that genetic diagnosis is intrinsically more emotionally freighted than our other forms of diagnosis. The fourth one is sort of an umbrella for a number of these ideas, which is somehow the risks of genetics, either in the practice of science in the laboratory, its social implications, or its clinical implementation are somehow greater than other forms of science or medicine that we practice. One that's particularly corrosive is the uh, paternalistic notion that genetics is just too complicated for these primary care practitioners who are trying to turn your discoveries into improved health care. And the last one, particularly fascinating to me, is that there is an idea that somehow autonomy or individual decision making is more important in genetics than it is in other realms. I believe, my thesis is, and I want to try and convince you of that, and we'll uh, try to do that through the symposium on Thursday, is that none of these concepts are valid. More importantly, these concepts, I believe, create barriers. Barriers between geneticists and other scientists. Barriers between genetic practitioners and other clinicians, and that we must break down these barriers in order to achieve the success that we want. In some ways, I believe that our end goal should be for us to continuously practice amazing science and make amazing discoveries going forward and develop amazing new diagnoses and therapies for the clinic and simultaneously to have genetics dissolve invisibly into all realms of science and medicine. That, I think, would be our success. And again, I believe that exceptionalism is a barrier to that measure of success. So I've told you many things about what I think are the uh, ways that we are exceptional in science and that we should not be so exceptional. Here's one, I think, that kind of captures the gist of the challenge that's in front of us. I think that in some ways, geneticists are the scientists and genetic practitioners, the healthcare providers, who are the only people in the academic and research spheres and in our hospitals and clinics who are or act sometimes as though they are afraid of their own technology. I'm not sure we should use this as an example, but I have never met a surgeon who is afraid of a scalpel. I have never met a radiologist who is afraid of x-rays. I've never met an oncologist who is afraid of chemotherapy. They all recognize that what those things are are powerful tools that they harness to accomplish the benefits of what they have set out to do and achieve and realize the values of the professions that they practice. 
we must do the same thing. And if we act like we are afraid of our own technology, our peers and our colleagues will believe us. That is not good for our field. So that's what I want to say to you about the exceptionalism of our field. And now I want to shift to the second point of my talk, which is how does an un uh, unexceptional geneticist become president? That happens through a number of things. Most importantly, I want to start with mentors and family, and also not pictured here, amazing people who have been part of my research group since the beginning in 1993. People who have supported, encouraged, and criticized me in my endeavors, all of which sharpened skills and allowed me to do things that I could not have otherwise done. This, my story I, is illustrative. No one here should care about the trajectory of my career except to the extent that is, it is useful for you to understand and think about what we as a society can do to enable and optimize everyone's career that is in this room. How my career started? interestingly, was in the Detroit meeting in 1982. Believe it or not, it was held in a hotel, the Renaissance Center in downtown Detroit. I don't know how many of you were there. I can still clearly remember getting on the escalator and riding the escalator up to the registration desk at that meeting as a fourth year medical student who knew darn near nothing about human genetics. I had been exposed to Drosophila genetics as a high school student but really was quite naive. And the reason I was there was to serve as the charming companion for a registrant at that meeting who was, on the last slide, my wife, who was a genetic counselor and who was in practice at that time. And I thought, why wouldn't I go to this meeting as well as her companion? And in fact, what I saw there was amazing. My eyes were open to a field that was doing incredible things. Even in 1982, amazing advances were being made, that discoveries were being uh, made, and the concept of what genetics was and could do was expanding already then very rapidly. I took that to heart. That meeting, the American Society of Human Genetics meeting, triggered in me the desire to be a part of your society. I felt welcomed and encouraged, even as a naive medical student, to be a part of this genetics community. I started on a pathway beginning with the uh, modest field of clinical dysmorphology. There is a few of you here who practice that today. My practice of research evolved from clinical dysmorphology to molecular genetics through to clinical genomics. That evolution of my career, again, the particulars of that don't matter to you. You shouldn't care, except to the extent that it informs what we should do to support other members. We undertook some difficult projects. We did some straightforward lower risk science, but we did some difficult ones as well. Worked on a disease that is never inherited, which in 1993 was pretty much not a tractable problem. That went from gene identification through to identification of targeted therapy. In 2006, we proposed to start doing clinical genomics, doing high throughput sequencing on healthy individuals and returning results to them. It was not super popular in 2006. How could these things happen? How could they have worked? The essential ingredient in that was a society that supported these endeavors. And not just blanket support, what the society provided to me, which is essential for all of us as practicing scientists and clinicians, are colleagues that are at once critical and supportive. The former sharpens skills, identifies weaknesses, and can refine the direction of all of our science. And that is a huge function of what this meeting is about and why we are all here, to see the science, to ask hard questions, 
to ask people, why does it matter? Why are you doing it that way? Why aren't you doing something else? Every time you ask that question, you help sharpen your colleagues' approach to the research problems they are setting out to tackle. This is a welcoming venue for ideas and progress and doing things differently. Our field, I believe, is changing faster than just about any field in science or medicine. And this venue, your society, you as members, encourage and support people to do that, and that is an essential role for you. You provide encouragement and awards for trainees, and that inspires and motivates people to do good work, to push their trainees forward out into the field and allow them to advance as many of us have over the years. As well, the society provides venues for members to contribute to the decisions, the policies, the directions of the society in ways that matter are important and provide a venue for people to improve their leadership skills. One of the great things our society does, which we are expanding now, is provides a journal that is a forum for ideas. Our journal has been very good to my research group in publishing ideas that were not so popular and were not the main model of how things were done at that time. That has been enormously helpful to our program. It is a critical role for our journal and we are expanding that in the future going forward through our new journal, Human Genetics Genomics Advances. So again, the essential ingredients here are a society that supports, nurtures, pushes, and encourages people to go into areas that are novel, paradigm-breaking, and forward-looking in order to improve science and health. The opportunities that the society has provided to me, again, for example, are things like working on committees where important policies are being hashed out, argued about, refined, and put forward. An opportunity to work on thinking in the long term about strategically what does the annual meeting provide to our members? How can we do this better for every one of you? to help with the editorial direction of our journal, the American Journal of Human Genetics, by being on the board, reviewing abstracts. Many abstract reviewers are here. They are a critical part of what our society presents to you scientifically every year and form the backbone of what this meeting is. The program committee itself makes hard decisions about how to organize our science in ways that will be both exciting, provocative, and robust in order that we can have a meeting that again encourages members to break paradigms and do new things and advance our science. The ASHG board, uh, which is an, also an honor to serve on, determines the direction of your society. These are contributions that we as a society want to be as open, transparent, and available to every member as it has been to me and my colleagues, and we want to encourage every one of you, whether you think you are exceptional or not, to engage substantively with us in this endeavor that we are trying to make better for everyone. My goal and what I'm doing is to use what has happened to me in my career, aided by ASHG, to pay forward opportunities to advance your careers, every trainee, every junior faculty who's in here, to maximize your success. The big question is, how do you do that? That turns out to be a strategic plan. So before I rotated onto the board, my predecessor, David Nelson, introduced to the society the idea that we should begin to think strategically about what you need and want from your society. That was a substantial undertaking of more than 15 months worth of work by many individuals, board members, staff, ex-presidents alike, with enormous input from you. We surveyed every member of the society. We surveyed the chairs of every committee that works for us to help us design a society that accomplishes these goals of supporting all of our members. We had a fantastic strategic planning committee retreat 
two-day workshop where we hashed out and had fantastic arguments about what ought the priorities to be for the society of yours. Consultants and staff wrote up a draft report. The board of directors critically reviewed that, hashed that out, and you now have available to you through our website the strategic plan and vision. This is a critical thing for you. I encourage every one of you to open that PDF and read that, look at it, and think about it because, it because it is the model for what your society will be in the future, how we can leverage your opportunities. And in a few short years, probably five to seven years, we will do this again. And I want every one of you to think about that strategic plan and how you might do it differently in the future because I want you to influence our strategies of the future. So what is that strategic plan? We included in this plan an incredibly simple statement. People everywhere realize the benefits of human genetics and genomics research. I hope that when you have left Houston at the end of this week, you know this by heart and you're almost tired of hearing about it. Because it is essential that you take this in and think about how this affects what we do. What is in that little nugget of a sentence? A couple things. The first is people everywhere. That is a strong and emphatic assertion that people everywhere of all geographic origins, all backgrounds matter for what we do, for who we study, and who our science benefits. Benefits is a concept that is absolutely front and center here. And this is something that I have worked on as the core of my mission of what I wanted to accomplish as president of the society. I want benefits, the benefits of the work that you do, to be front and center. That is, when someone thinks about the American Society of Human Genetics, and when they think about our field of human genetics, they think about how it benefits people. That is essential, and it has not always been present in our thinking, but I believe it is crucial. It is the core of our duty, I believe, as ASHG, to represent this for you to the world, that the scientific work that you do benefits each other, it benefits other scientists, it benefits the public, it benefits patients everywhere. And we need to think consistently and strategically and with a long-term vision of this is what we want to say to the world about the work that you do. It's fine to have one of those cute little sentences as to what our vision is, but we have to make it reality. How do we make it a reality? We have to turn that vision into practical things. So we have a vision. You've seen that. We have objectives. We have five-year goals. We have 10-year goals. These are big picture challenges that we have set out for ourselves on your behalf to make this a society that allows everyone to recognize that people everywhere can benefit from human genetics and genomics research. No small challenge. There is implementation that has to be done that is critical for the success of the achievement of this vision. How do we do that? We have to change how we do things. So to execute and implement this very clear and articulate vision, we need an executive director and an ASHG staff that are highly professional and serve roles that are clearly defined and allow us to deliver to you the benefits of such a vision. The lifeblood of how you as a society affect what our association does is through the committees. The committees that we build are not just honors that we bestow on people for being good geneticists. These are opportunities to work on behalf of the society to accomplish this vision, this mission of where we want to go. We have to have people who will help us be responsive to these relentless and rapid changes in our field. 
We have to have these committees serve in a way that matches our strategic vision and plan, and we have to have an open, transparent, and inviting pathway so that members of all disciplines, of all backgrounds, can contribute to this process and help us do this as well as we possibly can. Now, here's something that nobody wants to look at, but I'm going to show it to you anyway, an org chart. Org charts are really boring. I'm here to tell you this org chart is really important because this is how your society is going to get this work done for you. We have restructured the committees in order to align them with our vision, with our strategic plan, and align them with our staff roles in order that we can accomplish these goals and objectives and have all of this coupled to what your representatives on the board of directors want to accomplish on your behalf. These roles are critical. We have opened them up. We have expanded opportunities for members to participate in committees, task forces, and working groups. And we invite all of you to put your name in the hat. Again, whether you think you're an exceptional geneticist or not, we want to hear from you. We want you to participate. We want you to be part of this. The execution of a lot of this work depends on a staff. Now, here's one thing that I will say is exceptional about us. We have an exceptional staff, starting with our executive director and every person from right to left, top to bottom within our organization are doing exceptional work on behalf of you and your success. Okay, I'm gonna wrap this up. I've talked a lot about all the things that are not exceptional about us. So if human genetics is not exceptional, what is it? I would say it's not exceptional, it's astounding. When you look at the history of our field, what have human geneticists accomplished? They have accomplished things of the grand scale of understanding the molecular basis of evolution. Genes that underlie all, many aspects of embryogenesis and physiology. Genetic variations that underlie innumerable diseases. The elucidation of human migration and population structure. The sequencing of entire human genomes, transcriptomes, and probably many other ohms in the future. And down to the pragmatic level, genetic-based therapies for diseases that were widely assumed to be completely untreatable just a few years ago. These are astounding things that every one of you can be proud of as a member of our field and of our society. So, I think we are an unexceptional science, and I think you are astounding scientists. In this room are innumerable, people have, have accomplished astounding scientific discoveries. In this room are dozens of future ASHG award winners, future exceptional people, and many other people who may not be exceptional like me, but have had, will have the opportunity to contribute to the governance and the future of your society through participation in things like our committees, participating in our board, and I look forward to seeing many of you up on this uh, podium in the future giving your presidential address. So I'll stop there and I'll summarize by saying the sole focus of this unexceptional president was to leverage the past successes of ASHG to allow each and every one of you to have the success that you deserve to have through the astounding work that you do. I am greatly honored to have been selected as your president. I am loving doing your work as the president of the American Society of Human Genetics, and I wish you all an absolutely fantastic meeting. Enjoy Houston. Bravo.